actually is the strategic need and the business case for uranium mining and nuclear fuel production in South Africa. Bearing in mind that nuclear fuel is readily available globally and that the viability of nuclear power generation in South Africa is not really negatively impacted or dependent on uh, local uh, nuclear fuel production. Well, Chris, you know, it's my belief that we're at the beginning of a whole new nuclear phase on planet Earth. And to my mind, that is the right way to go. It is the environmentally friendly way to go. It is the sensible way to go. So what we have now, if we look at South Africa, is there's two factors related to the nuclear fuel. One is our strategic position and security for the country. We do not want to be dependent entirely on one foreign source of fuel. That's a very important factor. The second factor is now is our chance to climb into the world nuclear market and become major players in the world, major suppliers of everything, uh, of all types. When I say everything, I mean all types, not limited to one. And fuel is a significant one. South Africa is one of the oldest countries in the world in this business. We were approached for uranium in 1940. And uh, this was recognized immediately after the Second World War. And bear in mind that Nix's birthday goes back to 1948. And back then, those documents recognized the superior position of South Africa in the world with respect to uranium. Now, we don't want to just sell uranium ore to the world. We don't want to just sell yellow cake, which is the oxide that's traded. We want to actually sell fuel or to be in the fuel market. So what I'm seeing now is an opportunity for us to get into the market for the type of fuel that is put into Kuberg reactors, for example, the long metallic fuel elements, but also pebble bed type fuel, which is a cricket ball size um, piece of, of material that's very, very, very high tech that's been manufactured at Nexa to be equal to the best fuel ever produced in the world. So I'm looking at a potential for us to be world exporters and earners of serious foreign exchange in the fuel business. It's not just a case of us supplying ourselves. See, okay, thank you. Kunti, uh, moving on now to the Safari One reactor here at Pilladaba, where we are today. Uh, when will this 52-year-old Safari One research reactor at Pilladaba be commissioned? And has adequate provision been made in Nexus financials for the decommissioning liability? Has Nexa board now signed off on Nexa's 2014-15 financials and 15-16 financials with the concurrence of the Auditor General? As I know that there were some issues regarding uh, the treatment of this liability in the financials. Uh, Chris, uh, the, when you look at Safari, it's, uh, it's two years old, as we say. Uh, we call it a she. <laughs> uh, she, she's, she's, she's getting old, uh, but she's running the best, better than any other reactor of its type in the world. We run it for more than 300 days a year. Um, and that's, that's a very important milestone that we have, and it's, pro it's producing very uh, key, much key uh, uh, technologies. For example, for medical treatment, for an anti test to the petrochemical industry. It is a, a very important uh, a feature of the South African technology scene. Now, if you look at the way we, we deal with it from a perspective of uh, funding and, and, and uh, decommissioning, we have a, a, a cabinet decision that says government is responsible for the, uh, for the financial liability of, of this critical resource. But NEXA must carry it out. Uh, we must decommission and decontaminate uh, a, a, a reactor such as uh, Safari, as well as other facilities that we utilize uh, for the national good. So the, the, the liability issues that we had with the uh, AG uh, have been uh, dealt with. Uh, the, 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 the uh, annual reports and annual financial statements uh, have been signed and accepted by the uh, Auditor General. We're just starting a new uh, auditing phase now uh, and, and of course I don't expect this issue to arise uh, at all uh, at this point. But to just get to the question of how much life is left in this reactor before you actually have to start decommissioning, can this life be extended how do you see this? There, there is no such thing as life extension as far as uh, research reactors are concerned. There are life limiting 
uh, uh, issues that you, you have to deal with. For, for example, the reactor uh, vessel, uh, if it's irradiated beyond a certain point, then you have to decommission it because it will be too expensive to replace. Uh, as we are at the present moment, after 52 years of this reactor, it, it's looking like a 15 year old. So, so we can run it for much longer. Now, the, the reason I'm not telling you a date mm. is not because I don't want to, it's because I don't know. I don't know where we will re reach the life, li uh, life limiting uh, of, of the rate of pressure vessel. Now, the, the, the important thing is, as we plan, we plan for it to, uh, because we have to have a plan in, in hand, uh, for it to be decommissioned between 2030 and 2035. That's the plan that we have. But the plan is not informed by uh, superior knowledge of where it will be. It's just a plan so that you can, you can uh, put funding aside to deal with the, the, the different issues should it arise at that time.